before we talk more with Jan Crane, I want to mention to all members that our new forum will be up and running May 24th. We have an entire new website that we put together for this. We have one open forum and one members forum exclusively available for you. So if you're interested to join, we encourage you to simply log in to the members section and click on the Red Ice Forum button at the top menu. From there, you simply follow the instructions on that page and you'll get a confirmation email once we've enabled you in the forum. Okay, so let's listen to our second segment. We have Ian R. Crane with us on the line, and we have been talking about Codex Alimentarius, the food code, and uh, now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk more about the New World Order. Everything is interconnected, of course, as Ian mentioned in the first segment, so this isn't a great leap, really. Um, Ian, in your DVD, uh, Fool Me Once, you kind of go into uh, this very interesting area, uh, about the importance of, of Sion or Jerusalem, or I think you even refer to it as, as New Jerusalem, and that Sion actually is a word that is connected with something new. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, if you will. Yeah, hi, Henrik. I mean, this is um, actually the area that um, you know I, I really have specialized in pretty much in the last uh, 10 years. Um, you know, we've, your listeners have just heard me uh, speaking about Codex, um, you know, codex is a symptom, if you like. It's a, it's a manifestation, a physical manifestation of a, a much, much deeper agenda. And it's an agenda that uh, you know, really has some um, uh, very deep occult connotations. And, and the, the brotherhoods that operate um, uh, as the New World Order. I mean, you know, let, let's, perhaps we should first explore the New World Order issue sure. so that we can put the Zion aspect into context. You know, because it's very difficult, in fact, I would say nigh on impossible, to be specific and pin down the individuals uh, that actually make up the New World Order. I mean, everybody can see who the puppets of the New World Order are. Right. And, and the bottom line is that anybody who is in the public domain is no more than a puppet. Right. These are not the ultimate decision makers. Um, the decision makers very definitely do not get themselves um, uh, in the public domain, in the media, in any way, shape or form. They do not want any kind of public scrutiny. So these are the people who effectively establish multi-generational agendas. And the people that we see in the public domain, they are simply carrying out their orders, their instructions for the short-term agenda. And many of these people will not necessarily be aware of what the ultimate goal is all about. But they're kept under control ostensibly by money and blackmail. Right. And, and uh, in many cases, both. But... Um, you know, obviously, once they get their nose in the trough and, you know, once they start to uh, uh, benefit from the corrupt rewards that go along with them prostituting themselves to carry out the agenda of the New World Order, they're effectively a lost soul. You know, and, and there's almost no getting out. I mean, if they try to leave and try to uh, um, you know, do something that has a little bit more integrity, they will, they'll probably find themselves uh, killed. Yeah. You know, like the likes of Dr. David Kelly in the UK, yeah. um, you know, who uh, uh, tried to blow the whistle on the, the fallacy of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But the, the New World Order, ostensibly, is, is a very, very widespread network of organizations that carry out the work of the very small number of people who control this, this global web. And what we're... Uh, what we know, is, again, it's, it's um, plenty of evidence there to be researched, is that the vast majority of people, particularly in the U.S., where there's a greater openness, they're all members of secret societies. And, of course, the classic of this was George Bush and John Kerry both being members of Skull and Bones. Right. You know, you know Skull and Bones is a Yale-based society that inducts just 15 people a year. It's estimated that there are something like, you know, 550 to 600 members of Skull and Bones alive at any one time. And, and here we are in, an, in a country of 300 million people. The two candidates for 
president are both members of Skull and Bones. Right. <laughs> and the media gave them an easy ride on it because, you know, when George Bush was asked if he would talk about Skull and Bones, and uh, he simply said, well, it's a secret society, so I can't tell you. Mm. <laughs> and then John Kerry gave a very similar trite response. And that was it. The interviewer didn't sort of pursue it at all. Right. But Skull and Bones is very definitely an organization that has achieved the ascendancy in the U.S. And then under Skull and Bones is an organization that um, uh, very few people have heard of. It's called Phi Beta Kappa. Mm -hmm. Phi Beta Kappa is a much older um, brotherhood. It, Phi Beta Kappa was actually established on December the 5th, um, 1776. And it was effectively established by uh, a group of people who were <laughs> pretty pissed off that they weren't invited to participate in the... Um, uh, establishment of the Declaration of Independence. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, so Phi Beta Kappa uh, had the ascendancy for a long time. But then in the latter, po well, from the uh, probably the early part of the 20th century, from about 1920 onwards, Skull and Bones started to uh, sort of wrestle control and, and ascendancy from Phi Beta Kappa. So what you have today is very much a hierarchy in the U.S., which is Skull and Bones at the at the top end, then Phi Beta Kappa. Then you have the Shriners, then you have the Freemasons, and, uh, and, and fundamentally, everybody, everybody in political or, or corporate or military life in the U.S. is a member of one of those organizations. Hmm. And their first loyalty is to those organizations and to the hierarchy of the brotherhoods and, and not their employer. Hmm. So this is how, I mean, it's a classic example of how a country is, is surreptitiously controlled. I mean, you know, the, the natural um, and judicial law of the country is almost irrelevant because uh, and it, it's very definitely subordinate to the, the law, if you like, or the direction of the, uh, the brotherhoods. Now, that's just the U.S. They use an example. A similar sort of structure effectively exists on a global basis. Mm. Now, at the, at the, um, within the brotherhoods, there is this phrase that uh, is, is used, which is the, you know, the New World Order. And what that means is a one-world government. And it is also known in many of the brotherhoods as the quest for Zion. Right. The quest for Zion, which effectively means the new start, the fresh start. So this is, this is a term not to be confused with the Zionists, as it were, um, associated with um, you know, the extremist religio-political organization, which is, is, is a Judeo-Christian organization. Mm. And, of course, in the U.S., um, the, the debate is kept away from Zionism by uh, organizations like the ADL, the Anti-Defamation mm. League, yeah, yeah. and the America-Israel Public Affairs Committee, you know, who effectively, any time anybody tries to discuss Zionism, they're, acu they're immediately accused of being anti-Semitic. Yeah, of course. Which is yeah. you know, intellectually dishonest, but it's a very, very effective tool of stopping people debating you know, the whole issue of uh, the Zionist agenda. Indeed. But the, the Zionism that we're talking about in terms of the brotherhoods is actually quite different again. And what they're talking about here is establishing the one world government in a particular city. Now, there are Zionists, and um, particularly the, um, uh, the Judeo-Christian Zionists, who look at Jerusalem as being the seat of world government. Hmm. But then we have other groups. And, I mean, there is a group in the U.S., um, again, within the secret societies, who believe that those in the U.S. are effectively the lost tribe of Matane, mm -hmm. a, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Right. And they believe that their Zion will be in the U.S. And, in fact, there are a number of cities in the U.S., not least Washington that uh, their physical layout is very much based on um, the, the architecture of the uh, uh, Temple of Solomon. Right. Um, and we have the same in Paris, and we have the same in London. And in fact, there's a couple of very, very good books that address this issue. One is by Adrian Gilbert, and, and the title of that book is called The New Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And the other book, um, which is quite a heavy tome, and that's called Talisman. And that's written by Robert Bouval and Graham Hancock. Right, right. And, and these books look at how the occultists have effectively tried to, um, to structure cities based on uh, this, this ancient um, symbolism of Zion. And within the UK, 
there are a group of British Zionists. Now, the British Zionists believe that they are the descendants of the lost tribe of Ephraim. Hmm. So these guys, their quest is to bring about the one world order, the one world government, but centered on London. Right. And they have a target date. And that target date is, I believe, 2012. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it was absolutely no surprise to me at all when London was awarded the 2012 Olympics. Right, right. Absolutely. And, and you know, we, we have to point out, I guess, at this point that, well, you tell us. Tell us about the logo of, of the two, 2012 Olympics that they, they chose. Well, yeah, the logo is, a, is very, very interesting. I mean, it's, um, it's ostensibly an abstract logo. And it was designed by a company called Wolf Olins of uh, London. Um, and when it was first launched, I mean, it was it, it had a lot of debate in the in the media because the cost of developing this logo was supposedly four hundred thousand pounds. Right, right. It, it was outrageous, <laughs> it was completely yeah. outrageous. <laughs> and, and of course, any of your uh, your listeners while they're listening, they can Google you know the London 2012 Olympics logo and and see what we're talking about for themselves. Yeah. Um. And within the logo, you can certainly see that uh, in these abstract shapes is 2012. But what um, uh, bugged me at the time was there was another component in this logo which didn't fit with the 2012 theme. I mean, if it was 2012, this component need not be there. And this component is effectively a dot. Well, you can also relay this out, and I show this very clearly in my uh, DVD, uh, Fool Me Once. What you can see is that this logo spells out the word Zion. Mm. <laughs> so Seb Coe, who is a British Zionist, um, Seb Coe was asked to explain this logo. And his response is very, very interesting, because the logo was getting a lot of um, criticism in the, me in the media. And at a press conference, he said, this logo represents something that we fundamentally believe in, and therefore we will not be changing this logo. There we go. So there there it is, folks. I mean, it's it's not a question there. I mean, it's, it's, this is very interesting. And of course, we, we can even connect this with uh, the fact that I think it was the day after London was, was granted the 2012 Olympics that... Uh, the seven seven bombings occurred, isn't that right? That's that's exactly right. I mean, you know, London had been partying the whole night because London had been awarded the Olympics around about um, uh, late morning, UK time on um, July the sixth. So of course there was massive celebrations, big parties in the in the centre of London, big parties in the parks. Um, you know, it, it was a sort of a, a sense of euphoria. Because I don't think anybody really believed that London was going to be awarded the Olympics. I mean, I think the favourite was Paris. Right. And uh, pretty much uh, everybody had almost resigned themselves to Paris being awarded the Olympics. I mean, but I mean, just look at some of the, the nominee cities of 2012. London, Paris, Moscow, New York. M New York, exactly. Madrid. I yeah. mean, these are high, you know, some of the, the most important centers, as it were, in the world for the New World Order, basically. No, absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, when the, um, the London bombings went down, of course, the London bombings also coincided with the first day of the G8 conference, which was being held in Scotland at yeah, exactly that time. That's right, because I remember Tony Blair kind of stood when he when he made his announcement about this with all of these leaders behind him. Like there was a symbolic ritual right there also, in a way, that everyone is behind me in, in, this, in this issue, in a way. Very interesting yes. to watching that, actually. Well, exactly. And, and of course... The, the New World Order have accelerated their agenda, and 9-11 and was the, uh, the kick-off point for this. Mm. Um, and, of course, the immediate aftermath of 9-11 of was, was, in the first instance, of course, was the demonization of Muslims. Mm. Um, and, and that was a, a U.S.-driven Western demonization of Muslims. Yeah. And as we said earlier, you know, fortunately, um, more and more...